Library Museum. My name is Anne-Marie Paquette. I'm the Clarice and Robert H. Smith educator here, so it is my pleasure to organize programs like this one, everything from our Kids Summer Art Camp all the way up to lectures and exhibition events as well. This fall we have a very special exhibition on view, Side Saddle, 1690 to 1935. If you haven't had a chance to see the show yet, we have free admission tomorrow and this Saturday if you need an excuse to come in while you're attending the fall races. Now, when I heard that we were putting on this Side Saddle exhibition, my first thought was that we would have to find a way to partner with the Side Saddle Chase Foundation for a program. Um, we've worked with the Side Saddle Chase Foundation a few, a few times now over the last couple of years, um, including two years ago when they had their award ceremony here, and actually their trophy, the Uma Van Sweden Perpetual Trophy, is housed here as part of our trophy collection. It's actually in the window cabinets out there in the, in the foyer, if you saw them. Um, so we're very excited to rely on these ladies and their expertise in the field. Um, both as side saddle riders, these ladies compete you know, in the field, um, but they also have other interests with side saddle riding. A lot of people don't realize that many of these saddles and even some of the habits and other tag items, you can't get new. A lot of times you have to make them yourself or you have to make do with an antique item or a vintage item, and that's something that all three of these ladies have some knowledge in. I'm excited to hear about their intuitive taking of side saddle riding, how they've made it something new here in America, and also how they've learned maybe from um, writers across the world and throughout history on these topics as well. But to tell us more about themselves um, and the topic tonight, I'm going to bring up Devin Zabrobius. Thank you. Uh, insisted 
insisted on changes to the side saddle, and she wanted to make sure she began to face forward for more security and to have more control of her own horse. So that's when we had the introduction of the two pommels, is what you see on the lower right, and the right thigh would nestle in between these two pommels. This saddle is missing the slipper stirrup, which was developed in the 16th century. So this was uh, at least modestly, modestly enclosed from the toe to sit into, and then a flat, a flat platform for the rest of the foot. Um, this saddle, obviously, being a 16th century saddle, is not so they were, you're fine. Um, they were fine to have what, what they could come about. Uh, more changes began to occur in the side saddle, but not very far. The two pommel slightly changed in the Victorian era. Um, as you see, it got a little more, a little more ornate. The leather was a little more stable, um, but this was still just a common saddle. It wasn't all that secure. Um, some women were not going to ride cross country. They weren't going to hunt in these saddles. They were very much lined for a ride in the park or a gentle country stroll. Uh, the slipper stirrup also was not a very safe feature of the saddle because if a woman would come off, the foot did not release from the slipper stirrup all that well. Towards the end of the 18th century, some women such as Catherine the Great of Russia and Marie Antoinette actually chose to ride astride. Um, it was not looked upon well by the other nobility of their countries. Uh, Marie Antoinette actually relinquished riding astride once she became queen. Uh, and then in 1805, a Milanese riding master, uh, Federico Mazzicelli, uh, made a claim in his book that women could not ride astride because they had more rounded thighs than men and could not grip onto the saddle properly. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of the nobility in Europe thought this was a brilliant idea, and they fully accepted it, and his book, uh, Scopula Equestra, remained very popular uh, until the late 19th century. Over time, further adjustments began to be made to the saddle, um, but the things that were still sort of common were that you had a solid stirrup bar so that the leather would either wrap right around it, it wouldn't come off, which of course means if it came off the, the saddle, you know, the, the leather is not going to come off. Um, but one of the adaptations was there was a mechanism for adjusting the leather that actually went underneath the horse, so on top of the girth, so the woman could actually reach over by herself and just adjust her stirrup if she needed to. So she didn't need to have a groom for that, but she needed a groom to get on, get off, and help for anything else. They really radical change that revolutionized the saddle was done in the 1830s with the invention of the lower pommel or the leaping horn on the saddle. And if you look at the picture, it's the curved one on the bus. And this allowed for women to basically do anything that a man can do on a horse. So they could ride across the country, go at speed, they could jump. Um, and with this all going on, people, the women began to become much more, I wouldn't say independent because they were still really restricted, but they were able to get out of the really closeted society that was going on during that period. Uh, the impact of the second pommel really started to have more and more women in the hunt field. Uh, Elizabeth of Austria was one of the most well known. She would actually go over to Ireland and hunt frequently. And I don't know how many of you have hunted in Ireland over the ditches and banks, but it's very serious country. <laughs> and she was just so uh, incredible to uh, be able to do that again in these saddles, not as modern as this one. <laughs> and she just went off and did it. Uh, more changes occurred uh, as time went on. We had a flatter seat start to develop. We had a safety stirrup. The stirrup would actually break apart to allow the foot to come out. Uh, a balance girth, which ran from the offside rear of the saddle diagonally to the front left, which provided more stability. And then finally, the breakaway stirrup fitting or bar itself. So if you came off, the actual stirrup would release. But the leaping horn was the major technological innovation on the saddle. So women riding the stride or side of the hump field became much more common. And this is today's modern side saddle. And as 
you can see we have one here. You all can look at it at first. Um, so it's mostly a very flat, it's an anatomically shaped seat. Uh, it has the two pommels and the breakaway stirrup bar. So the modern size up. Okay, this modern design really allows you to do pretty much anything. Um, so in 1915, Miss Esther Stace of Australia cleared six foot six at the Sydney Show, which is pretty impressive. And that record stood until 2013, when Susan Oaks of Ireland uh, broke it in clearing six foot eight on the Cuisance Wall, and then she did six foot three and a half on the triple bar with her other horse. I have no desire to jump that high. <laughs> so, uh, the position when sitting in the side saddle, this is what you usually see. It seems to be very mysterious for most people. They're like, ooh, you don't have a leg. Um, <laughs> so, you actually do. That's what it looks like underneath. Uh, so, the left leg is pretty similar to what it looks like when you're astride. The right leg is going to rest wrapped around the upper pommel. And the key thing here is to have your toe down. And I know that for all of you ridden for years, people scream at you, put your heels down, put your heels down. Well, if you come and ride with me, I keep going, put your toe down, please, put your toe down. Please put your toe down. And Alex is laughing. So, and the reason for that is, think about it, if, you're, if your toe is down, you're gripped around this pommel. If your heel goes, look like mm -hmm. your leg does, mm -hmm. right? And so that's your grip. So you want to make sure you have your toe. So from behind the side saddle rider, she just as straight as the stride rider, you just can't see the leg on the offside. And if you see someone crooked, um, you, know, you can say something to them. Sometimes they're flocking, they need to adjust their saddle, but they should look straight. Now, riding attire, very quick for her here. Um, so before, we all think of the pretty Victorian dresses and the Regency dresses. So we started to have changes um, in the 1870s, 1880s with the invention of the safety skirt which was still very heavy, but you can see it actually has a split on the side. So if you come off, it gives it more opportunity that it's not going to get caught on the pump. But the real revolution in a tire came with the modern apron. And this looks like a full skirt from the side, but it literally just wraps around, and you're wearing britches underneath, and you can't get caught, you can't get dragged, because there's just nothing there that you're sitting on. And here we have it together. And yes, you can drink through the veil. And actually, if you have enough, it actually infused the veil with a little bit of flavor. And so an hour later, you'd be like, hmm, that pork really was good. So um, today's Sideways Honey Riders, as I said, they're doing everything in the hunt field that these uh, stride riders do. So they can do the ditches and banks, they can jump the hedges and less sure. Uh, walls, our junior riders, are fully competent and can do just as well as the, the adults. Uh, you can parade down Main Street um, and then just have a lovely gallop in the field. Now, side saddle racing, since we are the Side Saddle Chase Foundation. Uh, this was actually a poster of Barbara Bailey from 1911. They advertised it, so this was sort of their informal draw. People were like, oh my gosh, lady, side saddle running around. Well, we're still doing it. <laughs> okay, so this is where I'm going to try to make this one. So this was the race that started sort of the revolution of bringing side saddle racing back. Because they uploaded this online, and we saw, well, the English ladies, and then we saw this, and we thought, boy, this sounds like a really fun thing to do.
can lean on. Our biggest challenge is finding these saddles were all, it's not like now when you go to a tax store and you, I need a 17 and a half inch seat with a long flap and a medium tray. Almost all of them were custom made to the woman and the horse. So you think about, it has to do with the, the, the placement of that top, what we call the fixed head, and then the placement of that leaping head, which is the lower one, the length of the seat, the width of the seat, where that fixed head is placed forward to the saddle, um, where that leaping head is fixed. Devin and I, even though you know, she's a little taller than me, we're of a similar build, we pr probably can't ride in the same saddle. Um, and then you have the animal in there. So our biggest struggle is finding the saddle that was made for the lady that looks like or built like me, riding the horse that I own. Um, it's a challenge. Okay, so we finally managed to make work. So we're just going to do a strip. So again, this is the, the original race that we all saw. And this is from 1923. And three and one quarter mile point to point race for ladies.
Susan was at 40 lakes in it. So that's just my, my little PowerPoint of it. Um, so now I'll turn it over to you all. <laughs> Saddles, which is exactly what that is, 
were made with a safety fitting up at the attachment point where the stirrup leather fits, meets the saddle. And then you can be redundant. Like I, when I race, I have not only have a I have a whippy with a brand new fitting, then I have a safety iron as well. So I think they come undone. I, I don't trust them at all. I, I just don't trust them. Mine's vintage. Mine's vintage one, yes. And it's a Scott, so it opens at the top. So yeah, I am not a huge fan of the safety irons itself either. Just like Sarah, because I've had, and I'm not a fan of the champion wilt fittings either. <laughs> my favorite. Yeah, I mean, so it's all a personal thing. Um, I've seen too many people when they go to get on, yep. the champion wilt, and as soon as they put that weight in the yep. saddle, it releases right and it comes mm -hmm. on. And you got to be careful you don't hit your chin on the leaping head as oh. you're coming down. <laughs> yeah, I've seen someone do that. They always gave some a black eye. Yeah, I believe that. Um, so yeah, cha uh, champion ones are not my, my favorite on that. Um, and, and I've also seen safety irons break open sort of in opportune times. Um, the only good thing is I'm, I wasn't really using the stirrup at the time, you know, because I don't put much weight in it, so, and I really have my right leg as the grip, so it was just like, ugh. And I think it was out in the hunt field, and I had a, we came to a check, I was talking to my husband, I was like, could you get off and go fix my stirrup? And of course he's like, but I don't understand how it goes. <laughs> Back. So finally he had to just, you know, take off, way to take off the syrup, hand it to me, I fit it back together, and then he put it back on for me. So it was just a whole lot of yeah, doing stuff you didn't need to do. You told me about adjusting the stirrup length. You should show, you should show me on that. Oh, you no know, problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's a special leather with a syrup hook in it. So what you do is you just slide it up, and it has a prong, like that, and it just slips through. And it's fine, but when you slip through it, make sure your thumb isn't right underneath it, because it's very sharp. And, yeah, but uh, it's very difficult to, to do that from on the horse. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible. impossible. Yeah. So you're always looking around for someone on the ground. Um, John Pemberton is really good. <laughs> He's really good. He's <laughs> <stress. laughs> real good for you. What is the little um, metal knob that's in inside between the two. The, you know, that's a thumb screw. So what that does, um, so this is a wide panel, a wide panel saddle, and I'm going to show you. Um, this saddle does not have two positions, uh, but you could, many did, Owens did, especially the post-30 Owens, didn't tend to have two positions, leaving head. You could actually unscrew this, um, I'll tell you another neat, thing about the saddle in a second. You could take all this off. So this is the leaping iron, and then this is reverse thread. Yep. And um, many of them had two holes. A lot of them had a higher up hole that was a little more forward for jumping, and uh, many had a lower. Now, the reason 18. So this is a late. No, that's 8,000. I was going to say 18. I don't know about 18. Uh, 8,000. And this is a Mount Street Address Owen. So this is an older one. So it's a little unusual that it only has one hole. Post 30s, they typically only had one hole because this fashion was too high with a longer leg. But um, I say about the address. Owen moved in 1923 from Mount Street to Duke Street. So. Uh, we know this is a post or pre-23 saddle because it's stamped with the Mount Street address. Um, but anyway, you would, that thumb screw holds cover to the iron where that little hole is. That's its only real job. Um, and the good, another thing to know about this iron is that sometimes the curve can be quite sharp. Mm -hmm. And if you have a fuller thigh, it can be hard to get your leg underneath it. So all you do is take off the leaping head cover like Amy did and then you hand that to your farrier, and you ask them to pound it out a little bit. Very carefully. Very carefully, just a couple hits at a time, and then you put it back on and you check. And then once it's to your liking, you just screw it back on, put the cover back on, and you're good to go. Because the cover will adjust to whatever shape the actual bar is. I actually do the tracing first, and then move it slightly, slightly, slightly until you get it comfortable. But at least that way you know where it will where it's going. So the other neat thing about this saddle, I'll, I'll tell you real quick. This has um, a tab for a, a groom's pouch, and I, I should have brought my 
with me, but it had a little leather pouch that was about this big, and it was in the shape of a stirrup iron, and it would attach, it had one buckle that attached to this little tab here, and it had a little loop on it that went around the billet, and the iron itself was collapsible, the foot would collapse, and it was on a webbing type um, piece of cloth with a buckle on it. So the lady would ride out to hunting with, you know, herself, and she carried this pouch, and it was called a going home pouch, because then her groom would pull the stirrup iron out of it, set it up, pull the footbed up, and buckle it to the off side, and then would ride home astride. Let me tell you, this, uh, the way the Owen seat is, is very, the Owen is known up, so the bellies are built up a little bit differently, so it's a bit of a wider sit. This is not very comfortable on the inside of your thigh, but they did it. Um, some of them had, uh, Champion of Wilton was known for carrying a spare iron on it, um, and you knew that if it had a buckle, then it was a going home because it buckled to the offside leather. If it had the safety fitting on it, then it was a spare because then it was made in case the lady. I always wondered, it was a Champion of Wilton that always had the spare iron because everybody was losing them because they stood in them out. <laughs> She was done. Oh, or, or it was second horse. Or second horse, yeah. Second horses. Yeah. Second horses. Yeah. So you would hunt four, you, four hours and four hours. So we would be out of the hunt field seven to eight hours. And so they would have sort of your designated area, and the grooms would show up with the second horse who was already saddled, ready to go, and switch off. Mm -hmm. Or she'd be picked up in a <laughs> carriage or a car um, back you know, in, the, in the early 20th century. So where did you come across the attack and was it in this condition? <laughs> uh, uh, well, this is my saddle. It's really funny. It used to be Amy's saddle. So I came, I got it from a woman in Michigan who bought it from Amy. Um, who I bought it from. She, she sold it to Amy <laughs> and then sold it to Jeff. And, and I know that it had been up in Connecticut for sale because I had seen it for yes. sale when Sue had it. Um, and this belonged to the former master of the Metamora Hunt in Michigan. Um, and there's, we, we were sent a bunch of the original pictures of her riding in it. Um, and it actually has a, a cantle plate on it that says Duchess. So whether that was the nickname for the saddle or that was the nickname for the lady, we're not really sure. <laughs> um, but so that, that saddle does have a name that it um, and a lot of these saddles we find, uh, I, I have found it at a flea market. I, I once, um, with people at auctions, um, other people will contact you and say, hey, I have my granny saddle that's been, you know, sitting in the room for the last 30 years. Would you be interested in it or would you sell it to me? Um, and, and that's sort of the most common way. Um, people find saddles on eBay. That's something to be very leery of because um, you don't you don't know what the condition is. There could be major problems with the saddle, um, or there have a lot of Asian, not very good saddles that again, if you don't know what you're looking at, you could spend money on something that's really not worth anything. Um, there's still a large number of saddles in England. Uh, not as many as there used to be. Um, when the women's lib that not, actually the suffragette movement started in the teens, and then that continued on, and then, then as more and more women and girls started riding astride in the 1920s and 1930s, um, by the late 1930s, riding astride was the most common, you know, thing to do. So it was just sort of the older ladies or women who belonged to families that were more of the traditional bent that were continuing on. And then when the women's lib movement started in the 60s and the 70s, a lot of saddles were unfortunately thrown into dumps and just had dirt shoveled over them or they were thrown into fires because they were just in people's tech rooms and they were like, no one's ever going to use this anymore. It's not worth anything. And every time I think about that, I'm just, it's just, oh, it's, you know, so many saddles were lost. Um, saddles are in various conditions. Sometimes they're very, I mean, this saddle is, almost new, I mean, really, generally in the condition of it. Um, and then other 
saddles need completely rebuilt or they seem to be totally fine and you you can do a really thorough inspection. You can drop the panels, you know, the underside of them and, and look at the tree and everything seems to be okay. And then you go hunt in it. And I, I had another Owen that I hunted in quite a bit. And then I was at an opening meet with Middleburg Hunt last year. And we had been out about two and a half hours and we were galloping. We jumped a big stone wall, we were galloping across the field and I just thought, huh, that upper pommel just doesn't feel quite right. And I probably galloped on another mile or so, and then we came to a check, and I said, this really still doesn't feel right. So I lifted up my apron, and I looked down, and the tree had actually broken, mm -hmm. right? Where the upper pommel, you know, met the arch. Because they're made of wood. they made of wood, so, so. And that's another thing that you should remember, that they're actually very fragile, yeah. and you should never drop them, or you just handle them so carefully.
and that's why you have that. And that it can be fed if properly cared for. We can because of the way they tan the hides then versus the way we do it now. It's, it's the biggest reason. And I'd like to ask um, for you, if you could, to flip the saddle up, because I think the fascinating piece about riding the side versus riding the stride is the base. So that's linen. And so if you're used to a saddle that's leather on the bottom and it rests on the horse, and we're all used to that, when you ride a side, we constantly have to reflock and restuff that because it adjusts to the rider's weight and the horse's back. And as the horse muscles differently, and Devin's reflocked for me, and I, I don't think you've reflocked, but do you have? So that is a, that's fluid. So you constantly restuff um, wool into there, and there are pockets. Do you, can you put there are pockets where you stuff yeah, the wool in. underneath, and then there's ones in the panel itself. There's a whole break here. The you, flocking holes. So if you, you think about arms. the saddle sitting on a horse's back, you're constantly going back and adjusting it and making it, to your point earlier, custom to the horse and to the rider. And if you see, um, so when you ride a stride and properly turned out, you don't use a saddle pad. So that linen is resting on the horse, and then you clean that up to shower to make it look perfect and white. You never use saddle pads at all. Yeah, they, and so that is the, the, that is the pad. Yeah. But yeah. remember, because they also were, as we said, custom fit for the horse. Right. So, so it's you, interesting to see that, that that's actually what is on the horse versus what we know as white saddle pads or even colored these and things. And the other key thing is that they're not evenly flocked. Right, right. So that... If, if you should look when, when the saddle's on a horse and it's girthed up and there's no one sitting on it and you look directly at the back of the saddle, the left side of the seat should actually be sitting up like this so that when you sit on it and put your weight on it, it levels yeah. the saddle. Yeah. And if they're evenly flopped, when you get on it, it's going to feel like you have no support because the saddle's going to go down on the left and then you're going to feel like you keep sliding off. On that note, because I know the saddle so well, so this saddle was actually originally built on, on, a, on what's called a wooden pad. Um, it had panels made for it later in life. And uh, Wickham, again for hunting, it was a felt pad that, like both Maggie and Devin said, it was built up more, depending on the horse, thicker on one side, thinner on the other, maybe tapered this way or that. It wasn't just simply a piece of felt that was cut out in the shape of the saddle. It buckled in the back, it buckled in the front, and um, you could use different Wickham pads on different horses. So you, your top saddle was made for the lady, and then you had different Wickham pads for your different animal. Um, the unfortunate thing about Wickhams was they were made for your cobby types, your wider, flat back horses, because they didn't have a gullet. They were straight across the horse, so they weren't for the A-frame shaped horses that we tend to see more frequently now, they were made for the flat copy types, but just a, a neat piece of information that there were other bottoms to these saddles as well, depending on your horse's shape and your, your needs. And I, it's even, uh, Roger pointed that out too, is that in the old days, we really didn't warm the horse, we weren't able to warm the horses so well. So they actually often lacked the top line. So they were, the backbone was more prominent, they just didn't have the fat like they have now. So the horses were even a different shape, which just adds to our problems of finding <laughs> rare saddles that are going to fit you and your horse. And I've heard people say, I'm going to buy a horse that fits my saddle. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I actually knew a woman that had a saddle that she loved. Yeah. And she had to retire her horse, and she went and spent the next year looking for a new horse, carrying her saddle with her. And then she would go you know, set an appointment and see the horse and from the, you know, video or conversations, it looked great. She'd walk into the barn, they'd bring the horse out and they'd start talking. She's like, Shh. take her saddle, right. put it on the horse and say, nope, not going to work, thank you. I turned around <laughs> and left. And it, it took her a year because she was determined she was not going to do anything but ride right that saddle. So. I know. But you know, there's so many nice horses out there but they don't <laughs> okay. Well, I had um, I have a custom saddler who calls on my farm every six months, and the last time he was there, 
he made me go look, and he had one of those in his trunk. Oh, and nice. he had just redone it for a client. Mm -hmm. So he is here in Virginia. Yeah. So if you need somebody, let me know. Michael? Michael. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, they are making... Is new... that the saddle that he did, or no? No, no, no. They, this is mine. That was Ashley's saddle okay. that he did. Um, there are making new saddles. There are two, three people, companies, that are yes. making them right now. Yes. Um, My cousin. Yes, she, yeah, she's one. one. <laughs> yes, all in the UK. Yep. Um, so they are out there, and that's something that's actually a desperate need. While we love our old saddles, the you know reality of the situation is most of them are from the 1890s to 1950. I mean, most and most of that is pre World War II. There was only Champion Welton that they really stayed around post war, post World War II. Um, and they're only going to last so long. So. We, we take care of them, we don't drop them, you know, we, we rebuild them, we repair trees when they get broken. Um, but it's really nice to have that um, ability to get new saddles today. It's still, there's not that many of them, they're not inexpensive. But especially if you have, if you're a rider that you really can't find a saddle that fits both you and your horse, this gives you an opportunity to have a custom saddle made for you. Um, and we actually have one of the saddlers coming uh, to the area uh, next Friday, the, the 19th, to show off his saddles and, and all that and talk to the ladies about it. So that's very exciting. So what about some of the horses? I've seen a variety of different types of horses. What, what works the best? Smooth. One that you're comfortable on. Yes. One, one, one that you trust. One that's smooth. Uh, one that doesn't rear. Um, yeah, it well. you know, no, it's, it's very not good. Um, the good thing about a side saddle hunting is you are very secure. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about a side saddle is you're very secure. Okay. Um, if you have a horse that has a tendency to rear and wants to go up and over backwards, you cannot bail out of these saddles. Um, they're great if you have a horse that bucks uh, because you can really lock on. Um, and the Army remount program that they had back in the day when they were uh, getting all these horses, you know, capturing them and putting them in the army program. If they had a horse they could not break because it bucked so badly that it got all of the soldiers off. They stuck a side saddle on it and they broke it in a side saddle because it's, it was that secure. Um, so for me, I like, and everyone has their own personality of what they want. Um, I like a, a good, bold horse. Um, you don't want them to pull too much because they're, they're going to drag you forward and it just gets exhausting. Um, but they need, for me, because jumping is really important, it needs to be an honest, you know, straight horse. So when I'm going to a jump, that horse better want to go to that jump too. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I've ridden pretty much any, you know, anything. In it, None of them yeah. seem to care particularly. I've never met a horse that really is. No, see, a saddle is a saddle. You know, as long as it fits them, then. I, I do remember climbing up out of a ditch on the first day out hunting on Patrick, and he actually looked over his shoulder at me, and he said, like, what are you doing? Are you <laughs> what on earth is going on
they've never had a side saddle on before and they deal with it, but I always feel bad. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I hope this horse isn't hunting again for a couple of days because their back's going to be sore. Um, and, and, you know, in Europe, they don't do a lot of butte, they don't do, you know, all of that. So there's going to be inflammation there just, you know, from the, the weight of the saddle and you sitting on them. And, and you don't post, on, I mean, you can post, but it's not normal posting like in a stride saddle. You just roll forward a little bit on your knee and it's actually tiring for you as a rider, so you need to build up your fitness to, to posting. Um, so yeah, you don't you don't really want to just go out there and you know go for hours on these saddles. I think at the height of side saddle, ladies hunting side saddle, the horses were walked and they cantered on the right lead, and that was it. Yeah. They didn't trot at all. Mm -hmm. And the horses actually, after you've hunted them for a while, really start to do a very nice hand canter because they know it's much more comfortable for you. Otherwise, you there's a lot of this going on in the trot. And uh, I, I always see the girls going around to Upperville, and the, the hunter judge is like, let's some trot for hours. And they're all smiling. <laughs> and you know that they are absolutely no, no, no. dying. We only <laughs> smile in front of the judge. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the time, it's... <laughs>
just because of a layout of race course, but typically they do try to run it.
the rated ladies division. That's your multi-time national champion right there. <laughs> She's absolutely amazing. And I can't wait until she gets a little bit older and I can drag her to Ireland with me. <laughs> because all the Irish people are like, when are you bringing Sydney? And I said, and her mom says, nope. <laughs>
I know that she's got lots of tack and, and habits and horses that can go. If you ask her, I'm sure she can get you started. Or you know, we even send people from a distance. We don't have um, a ton of instructors, but there are people that that's what we want to do. We want to, the more people that are out there doing it, the more we're seen, the more it can be shared and enjoyed and spread, and and the more fun it is. It's fun going to these races when we. We're, geographically, we're not all in the same place, and we know we're going to go to this race, and we're going to see each other and enjoy. Hey, look what I got! This new habit, or this new saddle, or you know, it's just it's fun. Don't be afraid about using your own horse. Or, yeah. I, I just winged it, and I brought mm -hmm. my horse over to her, and she put the saddle on, and yep. we walked around the end. the first lap. It gives so, us a reason to have all these yeah. fun things, and we convince ourselves <laughs> that we're going to use them for other people. You I mean, need this collection of things because. You mean we can convince our husbands? Well. <laughs> yes, yes. We can be very intimidating with like the top hat and the veil and the habit and like the side saddle out hunting, but like everyone is so friendly, like yeah. unbelievably friendly, and Absolutely. it seems like a company line because every time you ask someone out hunting, you're like, it is so much easier. I feel so secure, but you really do. Like you really, really do, and it's so much fun. Yeah, Alex yeah. started hunting side saddle last year, last season on one of our horses. It's like an addiction too, and the outfit just really. <laughs> We've been hosting a side saddle hunt that tell me uh, three years now. Three years. I think last year I had nineteen ladies. It's a wonderful turnout. We do. We have a uh, hunting weekend. We have a uh, clinic on Friday, so a cross country hunting side clinic, or there people can come if they're astride. They just you know just join the foundation. Yeah, there are people that have been riding a side for a while. No, no, no. I have no. several people coming who've ridden a couple times, and, and that's it. Um, and so they're going to do the clinic, and then we are hunt, and then we have the Latin Perfect Hunt Ball on Friday night. All you know, they're all everyone's going to. Uh, Saturday we hunt with Millbrook Hunt, um, and some of the ladies are going to uh, hunt a stride. Some of the people that just started, they're going to hunt a stride on Saturday, um, and then on Sunday we hunt with Lavin Fairfax, and they're offering a third field on that day, so they're going to hunt side saddle on that on Sunday and go on the, the third field if they feel comfortable after doing the clinic on Friday. So it's all. You know, different levels um, of people, and we welcome you know everything. We are still selling hunt ball tickets for the next seven days. They're one hundred and forty-seven dollars. It's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> we are very well known for drinking, having fun, admittedly. So Latin Fairfax is a good one to go to. <laughs> but as Dan said, you can even go, you know, to the clinic and ride a side or just watch and just listen and take in what happens. Um, the Side Saddle Chase Foundation website has excellent. Historical information. The foundation has been in existence for three years, and three years we've grown from one race to seven, plus clinics, plus hunting and hunter pace participation awards. So it's whatever level you are at or want to be at. But again, there's an incredible camaraderie, and you'll learn so much by watching everybody else. And everybody's very generous. The yeah. saddles are so rare, and they're so precious. Like you know every single thing about your saddle and where it's going to be done. What. And you really want to share that. And um, Deb and I coined a phrase early on. Um, it's a return to elegance. And I think just kind of like being in that moment of a return to elegance makes you want to do that. And literally, you are absolutely stunning if you're sitting or walking or if you're racing and galloping and jumping. But it's all whatever you feel comfortable with. But it's something to experience. And you'll, you can try it and know if it's for you and at what level. And everybody is okay with what level, but I think it's so nice to keep these traditions alive. My grandmother, who hunted with Potomac, who I never knew, hunted aside. And so I think it's very amazing that I've been out hunting with Potomac aside on the same ground where she was once. And to just know that. And how amazing is that? That we can still keep that going. The National Sporting Library has been a great partner, and everybody we see and meet, we go to Ireland and we hunt, we hunt here. People come over here now. So we've created an international culture. And I think it's pretty amazing to do that and to be able to start. And then we have you know, young women like Sydney and others who are rising stars. So I think that's the amazing opportunity is that you can really create that and do it and just try it. And if it's for you, 
lovely. So if not, I bet you'll just admire it. <laughs> the clinic was really cool to audit, just from like just the, watching the parent amazing. point of view. It was, it was really interesting to hear you guys all. Oh, and another thing that Devin didn't mention about the clinic. In the clinic part, not the hunting, you don't wear an apron. Mm -hmm. You get to see, mm -hmm. right? You get to see everybody's seat and their leg position and everything. That is so helpful. Mm -hmm. Because remember when Devin showed the slide of the woman without the apron? Mm -hmm. That really tells you. So to be able to see that is really helpful. But you can find all the info on the website, sidesaddlechase.com, or Google, Well, um, everyone's looking at me now. Sure. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know our speakers will be lingering for a few minutes if you have any follow-up questions. Um, if you're not going to be in Genesee seeing the race this weekend, you may be in the fall races. Regardless, we hope to see you back here at NSLM sometime soon um, to see the side saddle exhibition or to come to another one of our programs. Thank you again to our speakers. Um, thank you for bearing with us through some of our technical difficulties. Um, but most of all, thank you to Side Saddle Chase Foundation, um, to the competitors, to the ladies speaking tonight, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.